sunshine, blue skies. Please go away. It looked like my dad had been drowned. His head was big like a basketball. And my dad has a very slim face like mine. I understand he was out in California, out in Las Vegas a couple weeks ago. But he's begging, you know, and the guys give him a little bit of money just to get rid of him. David was a wonderful friend to have. I mean, we used to have a lot of wonderful, fun-loving boy stuff. Uh, I always remember when I would come by David Ruffin's apartment, he was always listening to uh, Sam Cooke. David Ruffin was the man, the voice that made the Temptations a force to be reckoned with. Prior to him joining the group, the Temptations had little success with songs like Dream Come True and Paradise. But once David joined them in 1964, the hits followed. Some consider Ruffin one of, if not the most outstanding male vocalists of all time. And you get no argument here. His range and the uniqueness of his voice put him in a class of his own. But dying tragically at just 50 years of age, left more questions than answers, begging the question, what really happened? Brace yourself because we are about to find out. Please go away. The guy has found another and she's gone away. The man most of his fans know by his unmistakable, calming, yet disturbed, raspy voice was born Davis Eli Ruffin on January 18, 1941, in Wynot, Mississippi. His father, Eli Ruffin, was a Baptist minister. Only months after his birth, his mother, Ophelia Ruffin, died, and his father later remarried to a schoolteacher. David began singing and touring with his father and siblings in a gospel group at a very young age. Leaving home at 13 to pursue the ministry, David's select showmanship caught the eyes of some in the secular music industry. He then moved to Detroit, Michigan, and was signed to Anna Records in 1960, and then Checkmate Records in 1961. The young singer didn't have hits with either label, but they were good showcases for his vocal ability and talent. In 1964, he joined The Temptations, which had yet to chart a hit at Motown Records. The Temps' hitless status changed in March of 1965 with the classic My Girl, on which David sang lead. The song stayed at number one for eight weeks, and the rest is history. The same showmanship that brought David into the R&B industry caught the attention of fans around the world. His stage performance was dynamic. His dramatic hand gestures and slipping out of the chorus to fall to his knees wasn't all this tall, slender man wearing black framed glasses could do. His voice proved to be powerful as he went on to sing lead on Temptations hits that brought joy and happiness in the turbulent times of the 1960s. However, these times also proved to be turbulent for the group. Tensions arose when David asked for billing before the group, a practice common among vocal groups of the time. Not only did the lead singer not get his name above the groups, but he was dismissed from the group in 1968. He was still under contract at Motown, though, and his solo career got off to a promising start with the ballad My Whole World Ended the Moment You Left Me. Subsequent releases failed, however, as did duets with his brother Jimmy Ruffin. A few of the songs were charted, and he blamed Motown for not properly promoting his music. In 1979, he left the label and went to Warner Brothers, where his career career unfortunately went into a complete decline. He later rejoined The Temptations for a reunion tour, but after that he fell into obscurity, and his personal life also took a downward spiral when it came to light that he was suffering from substance abuse and depression. He eventually reunited with former Temptations colleague Eddie Kendricks, who was now a solo artist in 1986, and they began touring and performing with Artists Against Apartheid, Live Aid, and Hall and & Oates. It's truly a dream. In 1989, Otis Williams was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and David and Eddie began touring with ex-Temptation Dennis Edwards. Weeks after the tour ended, David was dropped off at a Philadelphia hospital. And an hour later, the man who sang the biographical tune Statue of a Fool from every bit of his heart and soul was pronounced dead. While the official cause of death was ruled an overdose, his family has come to believe that foul play was involved. So, what really happened? Reportedly, on that fateful day, Ruffin accompanied by his friend Donald Brown visited a crack house in West Philadelphia. It was within the confines of this location that he ingested cocaine which ultimately resulted in his sudden collapse and tragic demise. After his passing, a variety of media reports surfaced, with some presenting Ruffin in an unfavorable manner. Nevertheless, his family contends that these portrayals distorted the genuine essence of his legacy, placing excessive emphasis on the controversial facets of his life. The Philadelphia Medical Examiner's Office officially classified Ruffin's death as an accident. Their investigation disclosed the presence of both and 
cholesterol in his system. Moreover, it was noted that underlying health conditions such as heart disease and high blood pressure might have played a role in his untimely demise. Despite the official cause of death being attributed to an overdose, speculations persisted regarding Ruffin's sobriety and the enigmatic circumstances surrounding the discovery of his body in the emergency room. Some contend that the singer had achieved sobriety for a considerable period, leading to inquiries about his bloodied clothing. Additionally, there were speculations surrounding the unusual manner in which his body was transported to the hospital. In June of 1991, Ruffin had just completed a month-long tour with Eddie Kendricks and Dennis Edwards. According to Dennis, each of them was paid $50,000 apiece. They were to be given $5,000 in cash and the rest in a bank draft. But Ruffin wanted all of his in cash, and he decided to keep it all in his briefcase. You may ask yourself, why is this important? Let's get to it. According to those who knew him, the singer would surround himself with lowlifes who made him feel superior. Dennis Edwards said that on the day of his death, Ruffin's main flunky or a right-hand man called him and said, David overdosed, but he's going to be all right. I took him to the hospital. The singer was taken to the hospital after he supposedly overdosed. But what happened to the money? Dennis Edwards said that he'd spoken to Ruffin earlier that day. And when he asked him about the money, the vocalist told him that he had it with him inside the briefcase. That information, combined with what Nedra Ruffin, Ruffin's daughter said, would make many wonder what really happened. Nedra's words were, somebody set him up for that money. That's only the tip of the iceberg. She went on to say she felt like her father was set up by a lady named Diane Flowers. I felt like my dad was set up by a lady by the name of Diane Showers, I will say her name. Nedra also claimed that he had scratches all over his body and his head looked swollen. She also revealed that her father's clothes were bloody and destroyed in Philadelphia before his body was taken back to Detroit. This is what Nedra said. It was said that he died of an overdose, but those closest to him said he'd been clean for quite some time. His clothes were bloody. His bloody clothes were thrown into the incinerator. He had scratches all over his body. His head looked swollen. That was enough to make his children children want a second autopsy. They were about to, but their minds were changed after their uncle Quincy, Ruffin's brother, told them that if they did, one of them would lie next to their late father. Most of this information came from Nedra during a 2019 interview in which she also revealed who she really thought took out her father. I just want to tell the world that my daddy was clean. Somebody set him up for that money and somebody took his life. But let's run back the hands of time and find why exactly Ruffin was fired from the Temptations Band. Reportedly, by 1967, David Ruffin had begun demanding special treatment as lead singer, riding to and from gigs in a private mink-lined limousine with his then-girlfriend, Motown singer Tammy Terrell, instead of in the group limousine used by the other four Temptations. The other members slowly became irritated and annoyed with Ruffin's behavior. Following Motown's decision to rechristen the Supremes as Diana Ross and the Supremes, Ruffin felt entitled to the same treatment and demanded that his group be renamed as well, to David Ruffin and the Temptations. As earlier mentioned, the lead singer was also causing friction with Barry Gordy by demanding an accounting of the group's earnings. Motown partially acquiesced by allowing the Temptations to retain an outside accounting firm, but the firm did not have full access to the books from the Temptations manager, International Talent Management Inc., a subsidiary of Motown. Some of this behavior was attributed to the fact that by this time, Ruffin had begun using regularly, building further tension within the group and causing him to miss several group meetings, rehearsals, and concerts. There was a consensus among the rest of the group that Ruffin needed to be replaced. When the singer missed a June 1968 engagement at a Cleveland supper club in order to attend a show by his new girlfriend, Barbara Gale Martin, daughter of Dean Martin, the group decided that he had crossed the line. The other four temptations drew up legal documentation, officially firing Ruffin on June 27, 1968. The next day, Dennis Edwards, a singer formerly of the Contours that Eddie Kendricks and Otis Williams already had pegged as a potential Ruffin replacement, was hired to take Ruffin's place. Edwards and Ruffin were good friends, and at first Ruffin went along with the changing of the guard and encouraged Edwards. However, at Edwards' official debut with The Temptations in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania on July 7th, Ruffin came to the show and jumped on stage, taking the microphone from Edwards, singing lead on Ain't Too Proud to Beg, and disappearing 
appearing as quickly as he had appeared. The singer repeated this stunt several times throughout the group's July tour run. Despite the group hiring extra security to keep Ruffin out, he continued to find ways to sneak into the venue and jump on stage when the group performed one of the songs he had once sung, Let On. In a story recounted several times by Dennis Edwards, rebutted by Otis Williams and Temptations tour manager Don Foster, after several of these stunts, the positive audience reactions, and a remorseful Ruffin's pleas to be let back into the act convinced the other Temptations to do so. Otis Williams informed the then still new Edwards that the group would lay him off and rehire Ruffin while in Gaithersburg, Maryland. However, when Ruffin failed to show up on time the next night for his return engagement, the group kept Edwards on and ceased to entertain the prospect of rehiring Ruffin. After Gaithersburg, Ruffin stopped attempting to disrupt the Temptations concerts and instead turned his attention to the Motown offices back in Detroit. He sued Motown in October 1968, seeking a release from the label, but Motown countersued to keep the singer from leaving, and the case was eventually settled out of court. The settlement required Ruffin to remain with Motown as a solo artist to finish out his contract. So, one thing is clear, Ruffin made quite a number of enemies, his bosses at Motown, his former band members, and his possible replacements, among others. But first things first, what do we know about the man who replaced him? Any chance he harbored ulterior motives? Here I am, stop where you stand. Well, there is perhaps no more daunting challenge in professional music than to replace the beloved and iconic lead singer of a vocal group. And this is what Dennis Edwards faced in 1968 after the firing of David Ruffin, the de facto lead of what has been known as the classic five lineup of The Temptations. Edwards, who died on February 1, 2018, two days before his 75th birthday, not only grabbed the mic with grace and aplomb, but helped preside over an era when The Temptations achieved their greatest success, including winning three Grammy Awards. The winner is, Mom. Purple was a rolling stone by the temptation. Born in Fairfield, Alabama, right outside of Birmingham, Edwards' family was part of the post, World War II migration north, which landed his family in Detroit in the early 1950s. The son of a preacher man, Edwards began singing gospel music as a child. A fan of Sam Cooke, the lead singer of the Soul Stirrers, Edwards was among a generation of young gospel singers who reconsidered their vocation in the aftermath of Cooke's move to the pop music charts. As Edwards told the Boston Globe in 1984, Cooke started a whole lot of us to stop singing spirituals, adding, Singing spirituals was wonderful, but there was no money in it. You did it for love. But then there came a time when you had to have money to clean your clothes, too. Edwards hustled around the fringes of the burgeoning soul music scene in Detroit, spending some time with The Contours, whose Do You Love Me was one of the fledgling Motown label's early success stories. David Ruffin, who Edwards eventually replaced in The Temptations, four years after Ruffin himself had replaced Al Bryant in 1964, was also working those fringes, which gives some indication of the sheer talent that existed in the city of Detroit. Edwards eventually signed with Motown in 1966 and was more than ready when he got the call to join The Temptations, when Ruffin's relationship with the other group members began to fray beyond repair. As Edwards recalled to The Sun reporter in 1973, when I first came with the group, it was undergoing some changes in personnel. We had to work longer to pull together all the parts of the group. Ruffin's final studio album with the group produced two number one R&B singles, I Could Never Love Another After Loving You, and I Wish It Would Rain, which peaked at number four on the pop singles chart. As such, Motown slowly introduced Edwards to the fold, his first vocals appearing on the supergroup project Diana Ross and the Supremes Joined the Temptations in 1968, which accompanied the television special TCB, broadcast in December of 1968, and the 1968 album Live at the Copa. When Edwards finally hit the studio in late 1968 and early 1969, to record an official Temptations recording, it was to a soundscape that had been gestating in the mind of producer Norman Whitfield, who had produced some of the group's previous hits, including Ain't Too Proud to Beg and Beauty is Only Skin Deep, both from 1966 and the aforementioned I Could Never Love Another After Loving You, and I Wish It Would Rain. Whitfield's profile at Motown was on the rise with the departure of the production team of Holland Dozier Holland and with his work with Marvin Gaye on I Heard It Through the Grapevine, which became Motown's 
Motown's most successful single in 1968, a year after another version of the song also produced by Whitfield, was a number one R&B hit for Gladys Knight and the Pips. Whitfield was hearing the future of soul music in the sounds emanating from the San Francisco Bay Area via Sly and the Family Stone and wanted to be at the forefront of that future. In Dennis Edwards, Whitfield found the voice that could realize that the future in a historical moment is defined by radical disruption. If Ruffin, at his best, was the most brilliant of late-night Lotharios, what Whitfield had in Edwards was a certified preacher man turned race man, whose vocals were perfectly pitched for what Whitfield called psychedelic soul. Beginning with Cloud Nine in 1969 and followed by Puzzle People and Psychedelic Shack of 1970, which included a run of era-defining top 10 pop singles like Cloud Nine, Runaway Child, Running Wild, I Can't Get Next to You, which topped the pop charts, Psychedelic Shack, and Ball of Confusion, which was included on a best of compilation in 1970. The rebranding of Motown's flagship Harmony Group had been achieved, but this trio of albums also included some of The Temptations' most politically conscious recordings, with tracks like Don't Let the Joneses Get You Down and Message from a Black Man. In retrospect, Cloud Nine wasn't just the first Temptation studio album with Dennis Edwards as lead. It was a dramatic rupture with the classic Motown sound. The new sound created its own discord within the group, notably with co-lead singer Eddie Kendricks, arguably the most recognizable voice in the group and whose classic falsetto could easily get lost in the mix. After the release of the throwback ballad Just My Imagination from Sky's The Limit, which topped the pop charts, Kendricks and Paul Williams departed the group for a solo career, but not without the remaining members and producer Whitfield taking a shot at Kendricks and Ruffin on Superstar Remember How You Got Where You Are. The Temptations seemed to be at a crossroads in 1972 when Whitfield, now focused on younger artists like The Undisputed Truth and the chart-topping Edwin Starr, when the producer brought them the song Papa Was a Rolling Stone. Whitfield was famously confrontational in the studio, often trying to coax otherworldly performances from lead vocalists. He and Marvin Gaye nearly came to blows during the recording of I Heard It Through the Grapevine. Such was the case with Papa Was Rolling Stone, a song that few of the Temptations wanted to sing, and given the centering of a shiftless vagabond black father in the song's narrative, one that particularly offended Edwards, whose own late father was the very antithesis of a rolling stone. Almost 50 years after its release, Papa Was a Rolling Stone is a definitive soul music classic. The genius of Whitfield's production, the string arrangements of Paul Reiser, and those opening bars from Dennis Edwards. It was the 3rd of September, which are as resonant as any lyrics in the Motown catalog. The song won two Grammy Awards in 1973. The, third of September, day I'll the group continued to record solid albums for the next few years with Whitfield at the helm of the production, but they would never be a force on the pop music charts again. Though albums like Masterpiece and the Afrofuturist 1990, both of 1973, were a mishmash of styles, The Temptations were recording music that remained well-received by so-called urban audiences, like the Commodores penned Happy People and Shaky Ground, both from a song from You of 1975, their first album after the departure of Whitfield from Motown. By 1977, Edwards had departed the group, and the group itself had broken ties with Motown, signing with Atlantic in what was the nadir of the group's existence. The Temptations would return to Motown in 1980, with Edwards back in tow as co-lead on albums like Power, a stellar Christmas album, which included one of the great soul readings of Silent Night and Reunion of 1982, which temporarily brought Kendricks and Ruffin back to the fold just in time for Motown's 25th anniversary celebration. The Reunion album was anchored by Rick James, James, who produced Standing on the Top, in which Ruffin, Kendricks, Edwards, and co-lead Richard Street shared lead vocals along with James. The reunion was short-lived. Edwards would depart the group to chart a solo career in 1984, with Ali Ali Woodson taking over the chair that Edwards once took from Ruffin. At the time, Edwards expressed some trepidation at going out on his own, telling the Boston Globe in 1984, I was frightened because I was leaving a legend like The Temptations. I've seen a lot of guys leave their groups and flop, but I waited a long time 
time to do it, and I think I was ready and confident when it finally happened. What finally happened was that Edwards recorded one of the great R&B tracks of the 1980s with Don't Look Any Further, in which he was joined on vocals by Cita Garrett. Don't Look Any Further is mostly remembered these days for the odd and even zany music video, in which Edwards never stops chewing gum, no doubt the byproduct of a 40-year-old man having to navigate the then-new medium of music video. According to Edwards, Jermaine Jackson wanted to record that song, but I beat him to it. Don't Look Any Further is arguably one of the few R&B tracks of the late 20th century that resonated across generations of R&B audiences, as evidenced by its use on Eric B. and Rakim's Paid in Full, only three years later, and on Tupac's Hit Em Up a decade later. This of uh, David recording the lead to Angie Brown, it was such a chore that his glasses, as everybody knew, uh, David did wear glasses. His glasses started turning. After a brief return to the Temptations in late 1980, Edwards departed for the final time and, for much of the next 30 years, toured as part of Temptations Review, which included a brief reunion with Ruffin and Kendricks before their respective deaths in 1991 and 1992. If there is a performance that most defines Edwards' contribution to the very tradition that allowed him to replace an iconic lead vocal, Vocalist, it was the title track of The Temptations' 1975 album, A Song For You. Written by the great Leon Russell and recorded by a who's who of soul legends, including Aretha Franklin and Donny Hathaway, Edwards' version of A Song For You is at once his own claim to his place within that tradition, and loving gift to the audiences that embraced him after he was placed in a decidedly no-win situation replacing Ruffin seven years earlier. All in all, some might remember Dennis Edwards as the man who replaced David Ruffin, but he might be simply remembered as the voice of The Temptations. It has also been said that Ruffin may have inherited bad luck from his predecessor, who actually had a troubled stint as the lead singer of the famous boy band. It's not too often when someone's dismissal from their group becomes life-changing in the wrong sort of way, but that's apparently what happened to original Temptations member Al Bryant, who was dismissed from the band in late 1963 after his belligerent behavior, often fueled by his heavy drinking, manifested itself one time too many. Trouble was that on top of the drinking, Al developed a bad attitude, Otis Williams explained in the book Temptations, noting that Bryant began acting out as the group's profile continued to grow. In mid-1963, Bryant attacked Paul Williams with a beer bottle after a show, but somehow remained with the group, with Paul convincing the others not to sack their increasingly troubled bandmate. But when Bryant caused yet another stir at Motown's 1963 Christmas party, Party, the other Temptations decided enough was enough. He was fired and would soon be replaced by David Ruffin. As Otis Williams related later in Temptations, the group encountered Bryant five years later following a show at Detroit's Cobo Hall, and he was in quite a disheveled state. His hair had grown long and unruly, and there were big, dark circles around his eyes, the veteran singer wrote. His skin was the color of ash. Otis also remembered detecting a deep sadness in Bryant's words when they spoke backstage on that day in 1968. Bryant was only only 36 years old when he died of cirrhosis of the liver on October 26, 1975, in Florida. But that wasn't the end of bad luck for the group members. During their earlier days as a group, Paul Williams was the only member of the Temptations who abstained from alcohol consumption. He would, in fact, lecture his bandmates about ruining their health whenever he'd catch them covertly drinking. That's why it's tragically ironic that Williams descended into alcoholism as the Temps began to enjoy massive success as one of Motown's most popular acts. According to Otis Williams in Temptations, Paul's drinking problem might have started when he entered an affair with a woman named Winnie Brown, who worked as the Supreme's hairstylist. Paul had married young and had five children, Otis wrote. He was devoted to his family but torn between them and Winnie. Before too long, Paul, who never took anything stronger than milk, started drinking. All in all, however, Otis Williams acknowledged in his book that it's hard to pinpoint an exact cause or driving factor for Paul Williams' problems with the bottle. But as he told Deseret News in 1998, it was difficult watching his bandmate develop a drinking problem almost out of nowhere. To see a guy come from drinking milk to drinking, sometimes two to three-fifths of Courvoisier a day, that was kind of hard to take, he said. So clearly, Ruffin wasn't the only member of the Temptations who ended up in the gutter, but undoubtedly remains one of the most famous and recognized voices to this day. After his death, Ruffin's funeral was held at the Swanson Funeral Home, and services were provided at Detroit's New Bethel Baptist Church. Pop star Michael Jackson paid for the funeral, and numerous celebrities attended, including Aretha Frank, 
Franklin, Stevie Wonder, Martha Reeves, Mary Wilson, and members of The Temptations, The Four Tops, and The Miracles. At the service, Stevie Wonder told the audience, We're confronted with a problem that touches every one of us. We're confronted with the most devastating slave owner of all times. The Reverend Louis Farrakhan, head of the Nation of Islam, told the mournful audience, In David, there is a lesson. We should not clap our hands and mourn, for he is out of trouble now. You are still in it. That said, Ruffin's legacy and body of work continue to inspire newer generations in the music industry. And that's it from us today. Until next time, thank you for watching.